reconciled with your body. The body is not the enemy, despite its desires and temptations. We must unite the spirit and body through Jesus Christ. This is a key step in achieving a balanced life and living in harmony with God's will. We can resist the allure of sin and worldly distractions by embracing the transformative power of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our beloved fathers, deacons, monks, nuns, and our beloved congregation, those who are with us in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, may this blessed and holy Sunday be a reason for your conversion, be a reason for your reconciliation with the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be an enlightenment to your life, to your way of thinking. In the Gospel of today, from St. Luke chapter 12, the Lord Jesus spoke about paying your debt while you are walking with your accuser. Before that accuser passes you to the magistrate, and the magistrate passes you to the judge, and the judge will pass you to the officer, and the officer will put you in prison, and you will not leave the prison until you pay the last penny. Now, when we look at this parable, when we look at this parable, my beloved, it is to do with this life on earth, not the next. When we look at this parable, it is to do while you are on earth, not while you are gone to the next life. The Lord Jesus said, reconcile with your accuser while you are walking with him. There is no accuser in the next life and there is no walking with him in the next life. It's definitely here. Now the accuser, some might say, is the enemy, Satan. But there is another one that is worse than Satan or more powerful than Satan. Your body, yourself. You are the number one enemy of yourself. You, as an enemy to yourself, is much greater than Satan being your enemy. And that's why the Lord Jesus said this. He said, do not be afraid of the one who can kill the body, but has no authority over the spirit. But I tell you who to be very mindful and fearful of, be afraid of the one who can kill the body and has the authority to throw your spirit in hell. Now who is the one who can kill the body but has no authority over your spirit? Satan. Satan has only authority on your body, not on your spirit. So do not be afraid of Satan. Eat your heart out, Satan. He can't win. You see, the enemy tries to come to your spirit through your body. The body is the weakest part or element in the human being. If we were to put it in marathon prices, gold is your spirit. Silver is your soul. Bronze is your body. So if you come third, you'll get bronze. That's your body. You come second, you receive silver. That's your soul. You come first, you receive gold, and that's your spirit. The enemy has no authority to directly attack your spirit. He has the authority to directly attack your body only. This is from God. 
he cannot he cannot go against what God has granted him as permission he cannot he cannot go outside of Jesus Christ so he comes through the body the weakest part and through it he tries to grab your spirit and drag it to hell eternal death the Lord Jesus also works through the your weakest but your weakest element to get your spirit also God works through your body to get to your spirit the enemy works through your weakest part to get to your spirit so as God works through your weakest part which is the body to get to your spirit since God works through your weakest part then be at ease and be confident for Jesus Christ is known to be the Savior he never fails be confident so what do you need to do give him your body how do I give him my body what does it mean give him his body you see your adversary is your body to the spirit you see the main parts that make any human being up is the spirit and the body these are the two main components what ties these two together is the soul so the soul's job is to tie the body and the spirit together why because the spirit is light the body is darkness the spirit is the living one the body is the dead one the spirit is from heaven the body is from earth one comes from above the other comes from below two different components totally two different components totally light and darkness can never mix together it is either light day or it is either darkness night you can't have day and night together at the same time impossible so how can the spirit live with the body in harmony the soul God created to bound the two together and live in harmony now the enemy to the spirit is the body why simply because spirit is light body is darkness darkness never loves light light cannot be with darkness when the light comes darkness disappears when the light is projected darkness hates it so do not wonder why are you in struggle do not say why am I fighting with myself all the time because one side the spirit wants to take you to church the body on the other hand wants to take you to the club the spirit wants to take you to Christ the body wants to take you to Satan the spirit wants to praise God the body wants to speak foul language the spirit wants to be in the light the body wants to be in those little dark alleys downtown in darkness when you come to pray the body is aching all over have you tried it <laughs> before praying you were fully alert no headaches no aches no pains the memory is so clear and fresh and revitalized the moment you came to pray you've got a migraine <laughs> your back is aching your knees are shaking and you're dancing and swinging left right and center the mind is gone everywhere except God 
you began remembering things 550 years ago. The things that never came to mind and until you began to pray. All of a sudden, I remembered the food is on fire, the clothes are in the washing machine, and it's raining, and it's thundering, and I forgot to call so-and-so, it was their birthday yesterday. And I need to send an urgent message. And this is all while you're saying, our Father. <laughs> you haven't even started the next sentence. And the body is iffing and puffing and saying, enough. But you take the body to M&M, wa'a wa'a duv duv. My goodness, the body is saying hallelujah. Now you're talking. This is what life is all about. Now, come on, let us dance and jump. 20 hours later of hard yaka, 20 hours later, the body is saying, I felt nothing. It was so smooth as if it was only 20 seconds. But 20 seconds with this good looking bishop, it was a life sentence. Come on, bishop. I want to go home, brother. Stop talking. You talk too much. You talked for too long. But a singer from Hollywood, please don't stop. Please don't say this is the last song. And what kind of a song? Nonsense. <laughs> this is the body. You know why? Because the body is taken from this realm, from the earth. Now, when you are at home, you're comfortable. But when you're a stranger in a strange country, you are never comfortable. The spirit is never at rest until it goes back home, heaven. The body says, I'm fine here, spirit. Tough luck. I'm dragging you with me to the club, to the pub, to the Star City Casino. We are going downtown, whether you like it or not. The Spirit says we're going uptown, because uptown is Jesus Christ, downtown is Satan. And the body says, no, we're going downtown. That's why the city at night is beautiful. They line up. Hundreds of meters to go into a little club. Boom, 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 boom. What is this? Are you okay? You're paying all these dollars for boom, 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 Wow. The body is your enemy. The body is the enemy of the spirit. The Lord says, reconcile with your accuser while you're walking with him, meaning while you are still alive. Walking with him meaning still alive. While you are still living in this flesh, reconcile with your body. Do not let the body be the enemy of the spirit because if the body becomes the enemy of the spirit, you will lose Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus said to the 12 disciples whom he chose himself. What did he say to them? He said, you were before of the world. Now that I have chosen you, you are no longer of the world, you belong to me. Before, you were just like any other human being on the face of this earth. You were worldly people. But when I came and chose you, you are no longer of the world, you belong to Christ. Biblically speaking, the world is resembled by the ocean. Every time you see the word sea or ocean in the Bible, it's talking about the pagan world. People who are materialistic, worldly, physical beings. They just live for this world. This is the ocean. 
the ocean, my beloved, that's where you get your salt from. The best salt comes from the ocean. The water is salty. So the Lord chose them from the world, ocean, salt. When you look at salt, my beloved, it, can, it consists of two components, chlor and sodium. Chlor and sodium, what makes up salt? If you put them individually, separately, both are poisonous, can lead to death, depending on how much you take. Chlor is poisonous on its own. Sodium is poisonous on its own. But when you mix these two poisonous components together with the correct measure, the food tastes magnificent. Oh, 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 oh la la. It tastes as if you are eating a la Champs-Élysées Paris. Very, very good. But they are poisons. But when you put them together, mix them together, chlor and sodium, with the right and correct measurement, the taste that it gives to that cooking, to that food, is stunning. From a poisonous, fatal thing to a very tasty, beautiful thing. The spirit on its own is poisonous. The body on its own is poisonous. The spirit and the body united together with the correct measurement is a perfect human being. Beautiful life, tasty life. Spiritually alone, no good. Physically alone, no good. You see, imagine this with me for a moment, please. Someone who is spiritual only, someone who is spiritual only mixes with people. They will leave him and run away. Believe me. <laughs> if I turn the other side and talk to you spiritually, you will, I'll lose you. I will lose you. I can assure you the Lord Jesus had a beautiful sense of humor on earth. He still has, by the way. Um, a spiritual being only is a complicated being. Any one of us becomes complex, people can't mix with. What is, I'll give you a taste of complexity. Why are you sitting with people and talking? You're talking too much, no good. The Lord Jesus warned you from talking. He said, you have to be quiet. You're watching TV, no good. Why are you laughing with these people? These people don't go to church. Why are you sitting with the family? Doesn't matter it's your mom and it's your dad. Doesn't matter it's your siblings. But look at him, they're just talking things. And why are you sitting with them wasting your time? Go in your room, close the door, lock your door, and read the Holy Bible, focus on the Lord Jesus 24 seven. This is what you call an oversaved person. An oversaved person cannot be swallowed. Yuck. Oversaved person is no good. An oversaved person, you are trying to engage with them a very, very, you know, simple conversation. They will complicate everything. Like, imagine you're at Mecca's. I don't know why I'm promoting Mecca's, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Imagine you're at McDonald's. You're at, you're at Mecca's. And you're talking to this oversaved Christian, or spiritual, they think they're spiritual. And you say to them, I'm hungry. Jesus said, I am the living bread who descended from heaven. He who eats me shall never hunger again. All right. 
Bro, I'm thirsty. Jesus said, I am the living water. Who drinks me shall never thirst again. Hey, bro, I lost my keys. Jesus said, you need the keys to enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, brother, I don't drive a kingdom. I can't fit it in the garage. Can you relax? I'm just having a fish burger. This is a spiritual person. Everything is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you heard people or seen people when they talk? Like you talk to them, hi, how are you? Thanks the Lord. Relax, man. <laughs> how you doing? Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm fine. Can you talk normal? My beloveds, if you think, <laughs> if you think by talking in this kind of a way, you are a true Christian, you're mistaken. You, you don't know Jesus. Yeah, you, you don't know him yet. Listen, my dear friend. When you get touched by the Lord, you do everything in hiding, in secret. When you want to say, hallelujah, and praise the Lord, you do that with the Lord, my dear friend. When you are, when you are with people, how are you? Eh, thank God, how are you? It's nice meeting you. How you doing? I really need your prayers. I appreciate it if you pray for me. I'm a sinner. <laughs> yeah, that's a Christian. <laughs> Some people got into the habit of talking, not living. Got into the habit of talking, <laughs> not living. They think by just shouting and that's faith. That's not faith. When you are truly living the faith of Christ, uh, you become so normal and you blend in with anyone. So you'll see the bishop coming and say, Yo, bro, what's up? Let me some skin, brother. Because I'm talking to young people. I want to make them laugh. I want to make them comfortable. I want to make them feeling at home. I want to speak their language. I don't want to be a stranger to them. How am I going to win them to Christ if I don't speak their language first? The body on its own is poisonous. Because all the body wants is everything that is worldly. The body wants to eat. The body wants to drink. The body wants to look beautiful. The body wants to wear beautiful. The, wants, the, the body wants a diamond ring, $50,000, and I'm receiving Centrelink payment. So I just counted by putting aside $10 a fortnight. Honey, hopefully in the next life, I'll get you the diamond ring. The body wants to have fun. The body wants to dance. The body wants to go on holidays. The body wants to have fun in this world. The last thing is one, the body wants to be in the church. That's the last thing. The Lord says, unite your body to your spirit while you are living on earth. How do you unite the sodium with the chlor with the perfect measurements? Let Jesus do the measurements for you. Let Jesus do the measurements for you. And the Lord said to the disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You see, because I, I, I received you from the ocean, from the world, I took you out of the ocean. In the ocean there is salt. But now, this salt that was wasted in the ocean, now, it is useful, it is used in that meal. When you put salt in the food you're cooking, what happens to the salt? Dissolves totally. You cannot see salt anymore. 
You cannot see salt anymore in that food. It dissolves totally in that meal, in that food. When you eat, you only taste the salt. You can never see the salt. This is a true Christian where, where when he mixes with people, the people are the food. When that disciple, when that servant of Christ is poured in the middle, in the midst of that meal, the people, when he is poured in, that, in the midst of that meal, when he mixes with people, he needs to dissolve in those people to allow people to taste the salt, never to see the salt. Because when I come to you, I am ordered by the Lord Jesus to give you Christ, not me. All I can do is for you to taste Christ who dwells in me. I should dissolve, I should perish, I should never be seen because I'm not here to receive the credit from you. The credit needs to be given to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. So when I talk to you, I need to make sure that you see Christ, not me. I need to make sure that you taste Christ, not me. I need to make sure that you are falling in love with Christ, not me. This is a true servant because it's all about Christ. It's never about me. I'm just the salt. But thanks to the master, he used the right measurement. And through his precious blood, he united the spirit with the body. Perfect unity, yet two enemies from two different dimensions and realms. But Christ made them unite as one for the world to see Christ through this one. And then the Lord spoke about a woman. She was bent. She had a big hump on her back and made her bend. For 18 years, she was not able to raise her head up and see the sky, the heaven. 18 years, all she was able to see was the ground. The Lord Jesus, in the synagogue on a Sabbath, he put his hand on that hump and she was made whole and she stood straight, no more hump, no more bending. She was able to lift up her face and her eyes and see heaven for the first time in 18 years. The leader of that synagogue, he said, listen people, you have six days to come and be healed except Sabbath. You have no right to come on a Sabbath and be healed. You are breaking the law of God. This man broke God's law by healing this woman on a Sabbath. That is a blasphemy. The Lord Jesus looked at him and he said, you are a hypocrite. If your ox or your donkey, don't you untie your ox and your donkey on a Sabbath and give him water and food? Do you leave your animal hungry and thirsty because it's a Sabbath? If you are showing mercy on an animal, how much more then we need to show mercy on the daughter of Abraham, meaning the image and the likeness of God? This is the child of God for God's sake. If you are showing mercy on an animal, isn't she much more worthy and more exalted and elevated than the animal? Didn't I create you humans in my image according to my likeness? Didn't I call you my son? I called no other creation my son except you. So why are you now blaming me for healing this woman on a Sabbath. This woman, 
represents every one of us. That hump is our sins. Our sins have become so heavy burden that they have bent our back. Our sins have become so heavy, we are not able to bear them anymore. We are not able to carry them anymore. They have become much heavier than us. They have bent our back and brought my face to the ground in shame. In shame. I'm not able to see heaven. And what is heaven? God. Every time you pray, you say, Our Father who art in heaven. Of course, I will never be able to see God since I am living in sin. Because sin is darkness. Sin is against God. Sin is going to lead me to hell. When I live in sin, I am separated from God. I am no longer able to lift up my head and look up to heaven and say, Father, I love you because I'm not your son. The way I'm living is definitely not a son of God would live. So my sins have bent my back and made me see the earth, the filth of this world, the sins of this world, the temptations of this world. I began to live a lustful life away from God. Thus, heaven became detached from me. 18 years I struggled to look up to heaven, unable to do so. And why 18 years when the Holy Spirit mentions numbers? In the Holy Bible there is a meaning, a spiritual meaning, a salvific meaning behind the number. 18 is 10 and 8 is 10 and 8, 10 commandments, 8, resurrection, eternal life. 8, resurrection, eternal life, 10 commandments. Every human being broke the 10 commandments, thus the back was bent. All of us, we broke God's word. No, none of us were able to fulfill what God had commanded of us. The wage of sin is death. Those, those sins became so heavy, my head reached the ground. Tried everything under the sun to be wholesome again, unable, until some person showed up in the history of mankind in the end of times, as St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, in the end of times, he came to be born of the virgin of all virgins, my sweetheart, my mama, Mary. Or in the proper pronunciation, in Hebrew or Syriac or Aramaic, Maryam. Wow. It's so sweet when I call her Maryam. That's the correct pronunciation of her holy name, Maryam. He came to be like us. He came to take away the sins of the world and wash him on Calvary on the cross with his, with his precious blood. When was this woman able to stand straight and look up to heaven? On the eighth day, eight. What is eight? Resurrection, eternal life. And this, I'm going to say to those who think the right way is to worship the Lord on a Sabbath, Saturday, not a Sunday. And they even call themselves seven days Adventists. Not Christians, by the way, with all love and respect. I'm not judging. I'm just quoting what they believe in. It makes them non-Christians. There are till this day some people invoke the name of Jesus and worship Jesus on Saturday, Sabbath. Sabbath is Saturday. 
Because they say that God, when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he said to him, Sabbath needs to be hallowed, sanctified. This is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is Sabbath. You sanctify it and on this day you come and worship the Lord. So they claim that the apostolic churches, Catholic Orthodox, they have veered off the road and they have broken the law of God by worshiping the Lord Jesus on Sunday, not Saturday Sabbath. Amazing. The Lord healed this woman on Sabbath, Saturday. Yet the Israelite nation have no right to work on Saturday according to their way of thinking. Till now, till now, when you go to Israel, the Holy Land, with all love and respect to the Jewish people, according to their law, Sabbath, they are not even to press a button. If you go and check into a hotel, when it's a Sabbath time, you will see certain lifts open up automatically, stopping at every level and open up automatically. You don't press a button. These lifts are made for Jewish people because they will be breaking the law of God if they press the button of the lift on Sabbath. To this extreme, misunderstood what the Lord God said, sanctify Sabbath, this is the day where you come and worship me. When you read in the book of Genesis, I don't want to keep you here all night long. I'm so sorry not. Come on, love. When you read in the book of Genesis, we cannot take Saturday the Sabbath as the literal day. The days of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 do not ever take them as literal days for one simple reason. When you read day one to day six, you will see the Holy Bible mentioning the following. Day one to day six, and there was evening, and there was morning, day one. And there was evening, and there was morning, day two. And so on and so on, till day six. When it came to day seven, which is Sabbath, Saturday, the Holy Bible mentions neither evening nor morning for Sabbath. Therefore, Sabbath is still continuing, hasn't finished till this very moment. And when the Bible mentions there is evening and morning, God is saying evening meaning beginning and morning meaning end. You see, the day of the world begins with the day, ends with the night. The day of God begins with the night, ends with the morning. When you come to the Lord, you come with your sin, darkness, night, and He cleanses you, you end up in His light, holiness, life. When you come to the Lord, you're lost, darkness, night, you end up being found, light, morning. When you come, you're a slave, darkness, night, you end up the Son of God, light, freedom, life. The world gives you light at the beginning, then feeds you darkness, death. Christ, you come with your darkness, he feeds you his light, his holiness, his life. So the day of the Lord begins with the evening, ends with the morning. That's why when we come to pray in the apostolic churches, for example, today is Sunday, if we were to pray the evening prayer Sunday, we would pray the evening prayer of Monday. Because 6 p.m. Sunday is the beginning of Monday. And 6 p.m. Monday is the beginning of Tuesday. So Monday is from 6 p.m. Sunday till 6 p.m. Monday. That's Monday. And from 6 p.m. Monday begins Tuesday till 6 p.m. Tuesday. So the Lord never mentions evening and morning for Sabbath, day seven. Therefore, it's not literal. Day seven hasn't finished. 
And also the Holy Bible never mentions that day one, two, three, four, five, six, how long they are. All it says, there was evening and morning. God knows how long that day was. Only God knows. Who says it's 24 hours? Nobody. When was the heaven and the earth created? In the beginning, outside the days. Outside the days. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. They were created before the days even were created. So can the earth be ancient? Yes. To God, time is nothing. A billion years to God is nothing. It's a split second. Any number, no matter how small or great, you put it next to eternity, it's zero. That number becomes zero. Any number compared to eternity is nothing. Because to eternity you can never put a number. So whichever figure it is, it's nothing. Anyway. Sabbath, in the Hebrew language, or Aramaic Syriac, which I speak Aramaic or Syriac, Shabbat. Shabbat literally means rest. Silence, calmness, quiet, it's quiet, that's Shabbat. The Lord suffered on Good Friday, Sabbath, he went quiet in the grave. Sunday he rose, early morning. So what is Shabbat? Rest. God rested on the seventh day, Shabbat. God rested on Sabbath. I'll tell you why Saturday is not a day. My question to everyone, when does God rest? How does God rest? See, when the Holy Bible mentions something, you need to investigate. Don't just read it at surface level and move on. No, you need to go into the depth. God rested on Sabbath, on Saturday, on the seventh day. Well, the question is then, how does God rest and when does God rest? Does that mean that he was working for six days and now he finished creating whatever he needed to create and now he's gonna take a break and rest? Stop working. Well, the Lord Jesus, who is God revealed in the flesh in the New Testament said, my father till now he is working and I am working. So if my father till this very moment is working, then he didn't rest on the seventh day. He's still working. The Lord Jesus said it, not anyone else. So God never stops working, my beloved. If God stops working, everything comes to an end. There is no life, there is no existence, there is nothing. God always works and forever and evermore he always works. So therefore, then how does God rest? How? I'll tell you how. When I and all of you are sin free. When I and all of you, all of us are sin free. Why? Because God is daddy. And daddy loves his children. We have parents here and watching us. Mom and dad. When you had your children, till this very moment, have you stopped working? No. You are always on your toes. You are always, even if you are not working physically, you are working mentally. You always think of them. Oh, what is my son doing now? How is my daughter? I just wonder, is she happy in her marriage? Is my son healthy? Is he happy with his job? What is happening with my son, with my daughter? Parents work all their life to do one thing to make sure their children are in good health, in good spirit, they are healthy, they are happy, they are successful, they have the best of the best 
of life can now offer. That's what parents do. True parents do. They have no rest to give their children rest. They have no break to give their children break. They work hard to provide for their future, to provide for everything they need. They work extremely hard. They never stop working, my beloved. But when do parents rest? The moment the children come home and enter through the front door and say, hi, mom, hi, dad, we're home. Thank God you're home. Thank God you're home. Thank God you're home. Finally, I was working so hard, waiting for this moment to hear you, to see you, that you are intact, in good health, and in good spirit. You walk through the front door, and there is a smile on your face, my child. Now, your mom and your dad are finally at rest. When the children are with parents at home. So when does God, our heavenly father rests? When we are home with him. How was that made possible? When his beloved and begotten son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the only begotten son of God, when he put on the flesh, when he came and was crucified, and shed his blood on Calvary and washed away the sins of those who accepted him as Lord and Savior. When he washed away our sins, our Heavenly Father rested. Why? Because now, for the first time ever after the Garden of Eden, I am no longer a sinner. By the Lamb of God, by the blood of the Lamb of God, my sins are washed away. I am brought back to be the Son of God one more time. And since the only Son of God made me the Son of God through His precious blood, through the holy sacrament of baptism, Heavenly Father says, my Son who was dead now is living. My Son who was lost now is found through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Therefore, since my child has come back to me again and entered my home, Finally, daddy is at rest. Parents, true parents, will never have rest until they see their children have made it back home. And heavenly, our heavenly father will never have rest until he sees his children have made it back home in the heaven of all heavens, the right hand of the father. So when was this made possible? The number eight, 18 is, 10 commandments, we all broke him, Jesus fulfilled them. And on the eighth day he rose from the dead, he rose on Sunday. Sunday, my beloveds, is the first day of the week and the eighth day. Number eight, when you read the Old Testament, the original text is Hebrew. So Sunday in Hebrew or Aramaic is Chav Pshabba. Chav means first or one. Chav means one or first. Shabba means week. So what is Sunday? First day of the week. Literally, if you want to say it, that's how it should be said. First day of the week is Sunday. Monday, tren pshabba. Tren means second or two. Shabba, week. So what is Monday? Second day of the week. Tlatha pshabba, third day of the week. Arba pshabba, fourth day of the week, Wednesday, and so on. But when it came to Saturday, he said, Shabbat, rest. So when does God rest? When we are sin free. When did we become sin free? When his beloved son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rose from the dead, all glory to his holy name. When did Jesus rise? On Sunday. From Sunday to Sunday is eight days. So the eighth day is outside this realm. 
This realm goes by number seven, seven days of the week, no more, no less. So the time of this realm is seven. The next life, the eternal life goes with number eight. Number eight, if you put it on its side, it's the sign of eternity, isn't it? That's number eight, eternity. Why is it eternity? Because they are two circles together. So when you put a, a dot in that circle, that dot can be the beginning and can be the end. However, neither the beginning of this dot has a beginning, nor the end of this dot has an end. You'll be going in circle forever and ever and ever and ever. You'll never come out of it. Forever. Dun, 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 eight. Number eight is the next life. Number eight is the day that has no end. It is the day that the sun of it never goes down because the sun of that day is Jesus Christ himself. He is the S-U-N of the eighth day that is eternal forever and ever. So God rested when we became sin free. How did we become sin free? When Jesus paid the price and rose from the dead on the eighth day. Therefore, how, where did God rest? In a Sabbath. Who is Sabbath? Christ. It's not a day, it's a person. God does not rest on a day. God rests in his son only. So the true Sabbath, the spiritual Sabbath, the absolute true Sabbath is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not a Saturday, not a day. What is a day gonna do for you, my beloveds? Nothing. <laughs> you go and worship God on Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, outside of Jesus Christ, you're wasting your time, you're wasting his time. Hello? You cannot worship God without his son Jesus. The only way to God is Jesus Christ, period. And if anybody tells you that you can worship God outside of Jesus Christ is a liar. Liar. Even if that person is a leader in the church, he is a liar. How dare you? You contradict what Jesus has said. The Lord Jesus said to the disciples and Philip more so, he who sees me sees the Father. No one, can anyone define for me what no one means? No one can come to the, to the Father except through me. No one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the only way to God. No one can worship God unless Jesus Christ is his or her Lord and Savior. Period. So I don't know whichever God you're worshiping outside of Jesus. That God is false. He's the only way to God. If I'm going to accept every religion, then I have to fold the gospel and close it and go home. What's the point of preaching the gospel? Why did the Lord say to the disciples, go to the whole world and preach the good news? Why? If everybody's worshiping God, then why go and be persecuted and be killed and be slain for my name's sake? Why? Why? Why, why would the Lord even die on the cross if everybody's worshiping God? For them to come now and say the Abrahamic faith, Excuse me? Abrahamic faith? Abrahamic faith? Christian people and church leaders wake up. You are playing with fire. I don't care how high your rank is. I don't care. Don't ever play with fire. 
Because the fire will only do one thing, it will burn you and devour you. There is no such thing as Abrahamic faith. That is a lie. I love every human being. I pray for every human being, but I cannot pray with every human being. There is a difference praying for someone and praying with someone. Total difference. From here to heaven is different. I have to pray for everyone and I have to love everyone. I have to love the Muslim, the Buddhist, the Hindus, the Shintos, and the atheist. I have to love everyone, but I can't pray with everyone. I'll pray for them, but I cannot pray with them. For there is only way to pray to God, and that is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is not being discriminating. This is not being judgmental. And please, for God's sake, stop doing everything wrong under the sun in the name of love. Jab yourself in the name of love. Pray with everyone in the name of love. Embrace everyone in the name of love. Go out naked with everyone in the name of love. Excuse me? Excuse me? Who are you lying to? Who are you lying to? There is only one God. His name is Jesus. The love of my life. The breath of my life. The sweetness of my life. He is everything. Jesus. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you made your heavenly father finally rest. Because it was only through Jesus Christ your sins were washed away. And the day your sins are forgiven, your heavenly daddy is at peace. He is at rest. God only rests when we are sin free. That was made possible on Sunday resurrection. He gave us eight. The eighth day he rose. The eighth day is eternal life. So resurrection means you have entered eternal life. When you entered eternal life, you are at home with daddy in heaven. Finally, daddy receives you in his heaven. And the moment you walk in through the front door of heaven, daddy gets up and says, all this time I've been working hard, nonstop. Finally, I see you in my home. I am at rest, my child. Let's put the prawns on the barbie and enjoy each other's presence. Mom and dad are working hard the weekend. The married children are coming at lunch to have lunch with parents. Mom and dad are frantically going and coming, buying things and cooking and chopping and doing. And they are sweating it out. And then all the children come, mom and dad extremely exhausted. But being so exhausted, the moment their eyes fall on their children, all that exhaustion is gone and forgotten because what makes them rest is children with them. Because this is their life. Their children are their life. And the moment my child is with me, my life is back. My life is back. I can breathe. The moment they walk away, I suffocate. Even if they go to sleep, they are never at rest. <laughs> but the moment children come, even if they're working so hard, they are at rest because what makes them rest is the presence of their children, nothing else. God rested on Sabbath. God rested in his beloved son, Jesus Christ, who is the true Sabbath. So please, therefore, when Jesus came, who is the true Sabbath, Forget about the day that you go and worship God in. Sanctify the day meaning, receive my son. Make my son your Sabbath. Make my son the day that God chose for you to come in this day who is Christ Jesus and worship me. Because you cannot worship God unless Christ is your Lord and Savior. You cannot worship God. Christ is the true Sabbath, not Saturday. Therefore, 
When you have Christ, Monday is Sabbath, Tuesday is Sabbath, Wednesday is Sabbath, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, every day is Sabbath. Anybody home? Make Christ your dwelling place for your heavenly Father to say, I am finally at rest. Don't go where Satan is. Come where Jesus is, my beloved. Can I tell you a joke? But in advance, my sincere apologies, I mean no offense to my beautiful daughters. No offense. So please don't, don't hit me. Please, please, please. This man married this beautiful woman. They had a baby boy. While that baby was still very freshly baby, the wife passed away. The husband decided not to remarry again, and he decided to go and enter the monastic life. He went into a monastery, and he took the baby with him. After 12, 13 years, in the, in the monastery, the baby now is a grown-up young man. This baby who is now a grown-up young man has never gone outside of the monastery. He has no idea what's outside of it. So after 13 years, the father says to his son, son, we need to go to so-and-so place. We need to buy something. So they walk out. They're walking. The son, for the first time, is going out. Has no idea what's out there. And every couple of minutes, Dad, what's this? Oh, this is a chicken, my, ch my son. Oh, okay. And after a few minutes, Dad, what is this? My son, this is a horse. Oh, okay. Oh, Dad, what is this? This is a cow, my son. Oh, okay, okay. And he kept on asking, Dad, what is this? Now, as they were walking, this beautiful young girl was walking towards them. The son said, Dad, what is this? He said, Sorry, my beautiful daughters. Nothing, nothing about, nothing, nothing about you. It's a joke, okay? The son said, what is this? He said, son, this is Satan. <laughs> Boys, be careful, huh? <laughs> don't be naughty, don't be cheeky, okay? Be careful. This is Satan. He said, oh, okay, okay. So anyway, they went and bought whatever they bought, came back to the monastery. They're sitting together eating. The father turned to the son and said, son, today you, you saw so many things and you met so many things. Which of the things you saw today you loved the most? Which of them you loved? He said, dad, I loved Satan. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Don't love Satan. I can, do, I can show you. Don't love Satan. And now, my beautiful daughter, on a serious note, you resemble the church. And the man resembles Christ. That's why there is marriage between Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Yes? The man resembles Christ, and the woman resembles the church. And I'll leave you with this. <laughs> You're not laughing. <laughs> What time is it, Father? Eight o'clock. Eh, normal time. This is the bishops talking, you know, it's normal, about an hour. I've said this before. This priest, it's a true story. This priest went to visit a home. Husband and wife, they've been married for more than 60 years. About 62 years together, one marriage. So he went and visited them. He knocks at the door. Um, the woman opens the door. She is in her 80s, wrinkles. Oh, hello, father. Father walks in, he sits down. A Couple of minutes later, the husband comes out, bent a little bit, old age. Oh, hello, father. But before he goes to the father, he goes to his lovely wife. He strikes her on the cheek and he makes the sign of the cross. And he sits next to his wife. The priest, is blown by this. He said, this is new theology. 
I've never came across this when I studied theology. So I'm very curious now, I have to ask the man, my son, yes, father, what did you just do now? He said, what? He said, why did you strike your wife and make the sign of the cross? He said, father, we've learned this from you. You are the teachers. You are the priests in the church. You teach us. Don't you say that the woman resembles the church? Don't you teach that, Father? Yes, my son. Well, when you go to church, don't you touch the church walls and the holy water and you make the sign of the cross because you are receiving the blessing of the church? Don't you go to church to be blessed by it? He said, yes. Well, my wife is my church, the source of blessing. So, Father, I didn't just do that now. I did it for the last 62 years, every single day in and out. Every morning, I open my eyes and I see my wife is my church. I receive the blessings by touching her face and making the sign of the cross. For she is my church, the source of blessings. The father was blown away by this old man theology. He said, no wonder you've lasted 62 years. Nowadays, husbands, they open their eyes in the morning and they look and they say, oh my goodness, Kiria they saw you. I married Celine Dion the other day. Today it's a gorilla. What's going on? <laughs> they open their eyes in the morning and you say, woman, whatever you do, don't open your mouth, please. Get up in the morning and say, good morning, church. And then she goes at you. Yeah. <laughs> you keep on blessing. And she goes at you, what do you want, huh? Why are you nice this morning? There has to be something behind this. Come on, tell me what you want. Nothing, you're my church. I'm just receiving the blessing. Do that every day. She'll be nice to you. And if she's not, God help you. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to have mercy on us, to forgive us and grant us that favor to come forth and receive him in the true body and true blood of Christ the King. Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all, pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the works of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. God bless you all. May the Lord Jesus protect you, deliver you from every evil tribulation and every snare of the enemy. May the Lord make you triumphant always, my beloved. Amen. While striving for righteousness, we must remember that God's grace is abundant, offering forgiveness and redemption for our imperfections. His mercy invites us to surrender our struggles, acknowledging our human limitations and relying on His strength to overcome them.
by embracing the transformative power of Christ's sacrifice, we can experience hope and salvation, knowing that our sins are forgiven and our eternal future secured. This divine connection, rooted in God's unwavering love, empowers us to heal our wounds, both physical and spiritual, and embark on a journey of restoration and wholeness.